If there were ever a poem that embodies Keats's vision of negative capability, it is his great ode to autumn. There is no I in this poem. The poet fully merges with his subject matter. He is the autumn that he praises. The poem is a generous consent to the isness of the world. Whereas in the other great odes, there's a sense of yearning. Uh, the poet wants to get out of something. He's vexed by the agony of his temporal existence, or he's confused by the possibility of transcendence of this temporal existence through some other means. Here, the poet is quietly uh, says, yes, yes, uh, the world as it is, is okay. I'm not going to yearn for something else. The oughtness, I, it, the world ought to be this way, has gone away. Now there's an embrace of the isness of the world. This is it. This is okay. So even a season that signals death, a season that is a segue from life to death, even that is worth celebrating. Even that has its lushness, its music, uh, its life. Season of mists and mellow fruitfulness, close bosom friend of the maturing sun, conspiring with him how to load and bless with fruit the vines that round the thatches run. To bend with apples the moss cottage trees and fill all fruit with ripeness to the core. To swell the gourd and plump the hazel shells with a sweet kernel. To set budding more and still more, later flowers for the bees, until they think warm days will never cease, for summer has overbrimmed their clammy cells. So yes, there is the lush imagery there, um, and the sounds themselves have a lush quality to them. Mists and mellow fruitfulness, close bosom friend of the maturing sun, these murmuring, uh, very lulling, comforting uh, M, M sounds um, we hear, mm, 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 right? And note too that grammatically the poet uses the infinitive quite a bit in this opening stanza. Uh, to bend, to swell, to set. And what is the infinitive? It's a verb form that has not yet been tensed. It's a verb form that has not yet been put into past, present, or future. So even though the poet is describing the cycle of the natural world, there are things that are growing. There are things that are decaying. In the midst of this, there's a calm. There's something that is motionless, that is still. The idea being that even though this particular season will pass away, this particular season manifests a pattern that is eternal. There have always been four seasons. There always will be four seasons. Say yes to that. So even though this particular season will live and die, and it might be sad as what we love passes away, there's a sense that in the overall scheme of the universe, there is permanence, there is harmony, all is as it should be. So in the first stanza, we, we see the, the early stages of autumn. Uh, things are growing and getting ready to be harvest. Apples and gourds and hazelnuts. In the second stanza, we actually get to see um, autumn personified harvest, um, the bounty of fall. Now, again, it's interesting that there is no I in this poem. Instead, the only actor in this poem, the only being with, with what we would call human agency, is autumn herself. So the poet becomes the season and acts as the season would act. Who hath not seen thee oft amid thy store? Sometimes whoever seeks abroad may find thee sitting careless on a granary floor, thy hair soft lifted by the winnowing wind, or on a half-reaped furrow sound asleep, drowsed with the fume of poppies, while thy hook spares the next swath and all its twined flowers. And sometimes, like a gleaner, thou dost keep steady thy laden head across a brook, or by a cider press with patient look, Thou watchest the last oozings hours by hours. So this lovely image of, 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 of autumn going through the work of the harvest and, and taking a break in the middle of the day, drowsed by the fume of poppies and, and, and resting for a little while. Uh, and, and, and also the idea of autumn actually you know, you're pressing, pressing the apples in, in, into cider. So here we see the yield of autumn. We see the products that, that 
human technology can generate. So, so if there is a, a worthy art, um, yes, it's the writing of this poem, but also it's, it's transforming the bounty of, of, of nature, its apples, into uh, tasty uh, liquids that humans can en enjoy. Now, what happens in the third stanza? Well, we gently move away from the harvest to autumn, pushing into winter, pushing into darkness. And again, there's not a lament here at all. There's not a sense that, oh no, winter's coming. There's more of a, of a, of a very stately um, embrace of, again, the inevitable. Let's not try to yearn for something else. Let's not say the world's fallen. Let's not say the world's evil. Let's not say we need to transcend this world. Let's just say yes to what is. Where are the songs of spring? Aye, where are they? Think not of them, thou hast thy music too. While barred clouds bloom the soft dying day and touch the stubble plains with rosy hue, then in a wailful choir, the small gnats mourn among the river sallows, borne aloft or sinking as the light wind lives or dies. And full grown lambs loud bleat from hilly born, heads crickets sing. And now with treble soft, the red breast whistles from a garden croft and gathering swallows twitter in the skies. Well, certainly it's apt that the final image of the final images of the poem are birds. If we think of this poem in connection with uh, Ode to a Nightingale, where the, the poet is, is just in great consternation over what does this nightingale mean? But here the poet's simply listening. He's listening to the, the robin whistle. Um, he's, he's listening to the gathering swallows twittering in the skies. There's no need for comment. There's no need for interpretation. And, and we simply feel that as, as the world becomes dark, even though it's becoming dark, darkening into winter, there's still these wonderful sounds. We, we still hear crickets singing and again, robins whistling and the, and the twittering swallows. So there is beauty, there is, there is vitality in, in every single moment of the season of autumn. And of course we can imagine there is beauty in every single moment of winter and spring and summer as well. So by the time I get to the end of this poem, I feel sort of cheap in even trying to interpret it. Uh, it feels like one of those perfect poems that one simply should read and step silently away from. Of course, I've not done that. I've tried to give some frameworks for understanding it as, as a work of literature, um, some frameworks for helping you analyze the poem. But it, it's one of those, to me, perfect poems and if, if we were in our so-called in-person class, the very last day of class, I would leave five minutes and I would simply read the poem or recite it to the best of my ability and I would stop and I would be silent for 30 seconds and then we would be done and we would feel those swallows twittering in the skies sort of leading us out, not into winter in this case, but out into summer which is what um, a great season, but also an anticipation of the fall. And of course, it's the fall that is what gives the summer its joy um, through contrast, just as it's the summer that a lot encourages us to welcome the fall.